So, <clears throat> welcome everybody. So, welcome, uh, welcome to the introductory course. Uh, this is a course for beginners, so that I think half of the people in the room can leave it now. <laughs> it's very, very introductory, and of course we were not expecting so many people. We were expecting around 50 or 100 people. But you are anyway welcome, of course. <laughs> There's an issue of magnitude in this conference. Everything is very big. Um, but welcome. So, I'm Federico de Maria and he's Giacomo Dalisa. We are two members of Research and Degrowth, a kind of uh, collective which has been working on Degrowth and promoting the international conferences. And we do work especially in academia, but of course in relation with the social movements, civil society, and uh, practitioners. Um, let me just tell you what is going to happen today. So, me and Giacomo are going to give an introductory lecture here, which is in streaming, I think. So, hello to my mom, and um, also translated into German. After the uh, lecture, because it's impossible to have a discussion with so many people, the idea is that we will split in small groups. So, we will have half an hour, I'll show you a slide. There is a list of facilitators, which are all R&D members and friends. And uh, next to the name, you will see whether they speak German or English. Most only speak English. And they will also have an expertise. So the idea is that at 4, at between 3.30 and 4, we leave from this room and go in smaller rooms. And facilitated by these people, you will have discussion. You could either discuss on general degrowth issue, questions that you have related to this presentation, or you can take advantage to the fact that these people have a specific expertise like ecological macroeconomics or the commons, and ask them to speak a little bit, little bit about this and then have a more focused um, discussion. There was also an idea to have a final get-together from 5 to 6, but that is cancelled. So you can enjoy, have a beer and relax before the opening. So, the presentation we are giving today is based um, on a book that is the result of the international conferences on the growth that we have had since 2008. It's edited by Research and the Growth and it's a vocabulary. So there are 50 different terms that explain a little bit the streams of thought in the growth, but also the courses of action and the potential alliances. And uh, we, the editors, wrote an introduction which is an attempt of uh, describing and explaining what is the growth using all, all the terms and the entries that are um, in that vocabulary. So the lecture today is based on that and it's, a very, um, it's an attempt, we could say, to summarize the degrowth literature and debate that we have had in the last 10 years. I see nobody is leaving the room, so I'm pretty worried about that. Um, what is it all about? It's, we are going to start with um, discussing a little bit on the definition of the growth. I'll give you some homework too. And then we are going to look at the history of the growth very briefly. And then um, discuss the growth as a vocabulary with the idea of the book that I just mentioned. And then we are going to also mention some possible lines of future research as there is st still a lot to be done. So, we start with the homework. So, I would ask you now to write on a piece of paper or think about it in two or three minutes, which would be your definition of the growth? You can start. You just write one, two or three sentences. You can write a book to one minute.
expulsing. I am circulating a flyer on the book with the table of contents, but don't get too distracted and don't copy the definition of the growth from there. Mano Mudo. Is working. It's working. Yeah. Okay, I will ask it now. Okay, thanks. And what's your name? Marius. 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 Come in your body. Abbastanza, sweet. No, Okay, you can you can now switch. Listen to the one of your neighbor. Okay. Okay, I know I know you want to discuss more, but we leave it there. the technical point so thanks thanks a lot that's great and you can keep uh, discussing after I would invite one or two people to read loudly a definition if it is short if somebody wants to read it anyone who wants to read it we have one there somebody else reducing the plague of people on the planet to a sustainable level in perpetuity. Thank you. And uh, we have Marius, somebody up there. In the meanwhile, thank you for Marius, who is uh, giving up some technical help and other technical people that are supporting us and the interpreter also to German. Thank you very much. Thank you. Degrowth is the name for an idea in which people become participant of the big and small challenges in the world today. Thanks. One more. Last one. An economy 
economic theory that tries to change the relationship between the increase in the GDP and the well-being of the society. Thank you. That's nice. So welcome to the world of degrowth and the idea of defining it. There are lots of ways of defining it. We have three, but we have, we have probably 300 different definitions in this room. If we look up at the literature, or either in Google, for instance, one could look that somebody is arguing that the growth is an ideology, so a system, a complete system, a comprehensive system of ideas and values. Somebody would not like that because of the negative connotation of ideology. Somebody would say it's an economic concept. This is also sometimes not accepted because it's too narrow. We say it's something more than economics. Somebody would say it's a framework, or maybe in social movement theory, what is called a frame. Huh? a name that mobilizes a lot of people, like uh, anti-globalization, for instance. We could say, hopefully, it could be a paradigm, but maybe too early to be a paradigm in the sense that Kuhn uh, understand it in, in the sense of a way of creating <coughs> new research questions and new research agenda. Of course, it's doing that, but it's not as strong as we would like it to be. We could also argue whether it is a social movement. Somebody would say it's an incipient social movement. Somebody would say it's already a consolidated one. But there are many different ways of looking at the growth, and these are just a few examples. But the premise somehow, uh, and what we have argued also in our previous work, is that the growth is placed at the junction of several sources of what we call streams of thought, which cross each other without being in competition. What do we mean by sources? We could think of ecology, democracy, ecological economics, critique to development, well-being perspective, which could be uh, Ben Didier, Schumacher's eyes, or so many other expressions in other languages, etc. So each of us normally comes from one or two different perspectives, and we met in the growth. So this growth is becoming a big river, which is the junction, which is the connection of many different small, smaller rivers. And also, when we look at the definition, we could try to list them in categories. So the easiest one and the nicest one would be the naive one. So it's a decrease in GDP. It could also imply that, but it's more sophisticated, more complex than that. Uh, we could look also at Wikipedia, which is very influential. And it says it's a political, economic, and social movement based on ecological economics and anti-consumeristic and anti-capitalist idea. That's why not, but it's a little bit broad, a little bit too general, in my opinion. We could have an anthropological one, uh, like on the world based by Giacomo, and we could say it's somehow a smooth reduction of the hypertrophied modern individual. So you could see that there are different visions, but the one that maybe has prevailed in the literature in the last year is the one that some ecological economists have given, which is the classical one. And we say it's an equitable downscaling of production and consumption that we reduce society throughput, uh, the metabolism uh, of a society, of energy and raw materials. That's good, but that's probably not enough. So somebody else, like myself, uh, with colleagues, have tried to complexify it a bit and tried to come out with a definition that would include the different sources that I mentioned before and the different uh, dimensions that exist in the growth. So we said something which is a, a small variation of the first one. It says, the growth challenges the hegemony of growth. So this is the influence from anthropology, for instance, the idea of the decolonization of the imaginary and calls for a democratically-led redistributive downscaling of production and consumption in industrialized countries as a means, because the growth is not a final end, it's just a means to achieve environmental sustainability, social justice, and well-being. This, of course, I like it. I mean, I partly wrote it, too, but uh, it's not satisfactory. So at the moment, I would say that there is no comprehensive definition of, this growth, of the growth, despite there are various attempts. And we could discuss whether we need a unique one. In, a, in our opinion, I mean in mine and, and Giacomo, we need a comprehensive uh, uh, definition, but it is not yet there. So you're welcome to work on it too. And I invite you to have a look at this. So this gives an idea that the growth is not just about less, but it's something more than less. And of course, in the vocabulary also, we give a lot of focus on the issue of different, apart, of course, from the one of less. And this, I think, gives you an idea of why. 
But let's finish it. Let's leave it here with the definition now, and let's go back a little bit uh, to the history of the growth and how this all came about. So you all know this history, I'm sure. So again, you are uh, welcome to leave the room if you want. But uh, if we go back, we could go back um, at the roots of the growth. We could be go back in very old, we could say, uh, philosophies, religions, and traditions. So I would start today from Aristotle. No, don't worry, I'm not going to make that. <laughs> but uh, I will start from the 70s. But ones, of course, could go back um, much farther. And the first one to use the word growth was, uh, we could say, the founder of political ecology, André Gortz. And uh, this is the first sentence in which we have found the use of the word growth. And he says, is the health balance for which no growth or even degrowth, and he said it in French, the croissants, of material production is a necessary condition compatible with the survival of the capitalist system. Today we could say, is sustainability for which degrowth is a necessary condition compatible with capitalism? And I think this is still a very valid question today that is also going to be discussed in the conference. This is the first use of the word. Of course, we are in the context of the debates um, in Europe, at least, or in the West, on the limits of growth. There is 1971, the Middles Report. But there are also very important and key degrowth thinkers, such as Nicolas georgescu Rogan, an economist from Romania who work in the US. And this is um, a, a book that came out in 1979. It's um, a series of essays by georgescu Rogan, edited um, by two French um, professors, Jacques Greenval and Ivo Renz. Jacques Greenval is still around and still writes on the growth. And uh, we also found documents that prove that Georgescu Reagan knew about this title and he approved it explicitly. So again, André Gors goes back uh, in 1977 and again refers to the growth and explicitly refers to Nicolas Georgescu Reagan. And he says only one economist, Georges Corregan, has had the common sense to point out that even at zero growth, the continued consumption of scarce resources will inevitably result in exhausting them completely. And this is because of entropy. Somebody might have heard of thermodynamics. Who hasn't heard about it? I mean, Wikipedia is pretty clear. But otherwise, those who want a sophisticated book can go back to the 1971 book by Georges Corregan, which is called The Economy and the Entropy Law which is all about this. But let's go a little bit fast. In the 80s and in 90s, there is a little bit the end of, uh, or at least a pause in the debate on the limits to growth and degrowth. This is the idea, we could say, the moment in which the oil crisis, which would be a peak oil in the US, uh, was already overcome. And of course, there was the advent of neoliberalism. Uh, so at this moment, there is not so much interest on these topics. But then it is only again in, 19, in the beginning of the 2000s that French environmental eco activists launch again the idea of sustainable uh, degrowth. And they launch it as an idea of slogan. They launch it on a review, a French review, French environmental review, which is called Seance. And, uh, and here we have the start a little bit of the degrowth movement. I will go fast on this. I think you all know it. Um, but at the beginning, um, the debate started in France. Uh, there was a first publication called Objective de Growth, which is a book also translated in other languages. There was a um, march in France uh, led by Francois Nader with the donkey, uh, popularizing and disseminating the growth. And of course, at that time, there was also the beginning of the French magazine La De Croissants. And the movement also spread slowly to other European countries. I would only mention Italy and, and Catalonia and Spain, but we could mention many more. And then, of course, there was a boom starting also with the conferences. But what, what, would be, what could we learn from the history, apart from the anecdotes that I like a lot, but they might not be of interest for you, is that in the 70s, we have really a focus on the limits to growth. It is more on environmental issues. In the 80s, we could say there is um, a debate, in France especially, on the idea of utilitarianism, huh? the idea that the anthropological foundation of economics based on the idea of utility maximization are expanding to all social sciences. And some people like uh, Alain Caillé, but then also Serge Latou, started to criticize this. Um, and then finally, in the 2000s, we have people like Wolfgang Sachs, or Serge Latouche, or Arturo Escobar, or many other people in the South also discussing the idea of the criticism uh, of development. And of course, Somehow, the growth is the junction of all this. 
those who are not familiar with these terms will have not understood anything and understand. But this is a very broad introduction, just to give you a broad idea of what this is all about. So, as I said before, the growth is the, uh, the encounter of all these different streams of thought, or currents, we could say. Uh, and slowly, slowly, because of them, the growth is also growing. And if you go back, uh, once the growth started to spread to many countries, um, in France, they also invented this thing of, oh, why not uh, have an international degrowth conference? And the first one was organized by Denis Bayon, Fabrice Filippo, and Francois Schneider in Paris. And then we had many others in Barcelona and Venice, Montreal, and now in Leipzig. And in the future, we don't know yet. Um, but the idea here is that it was a little bit to bring the debate up in academia. But also then, starting especially from the Barcelona conference, to try and merge and connect academia with social movement and civil society. Something that was not easy, because sometimes different actors have different expectations. But we are trying also, and it's also an experiment, um, to test new and, we could say, hopefully innovative methodologies of participatory uh, conferences. As I said before, the conferences were promoted by Research and the Growth. You can have a look at, on the web page what we do. We just had the summer school in, in Barcelona with almost 100 students. There was a meeting um, in France uh, of especially South European activists just a week ago. And we have also some contacts abroad. And for example, there is going to be a symposium, the first symposium on the Growth in India next week. So the Growth is really much uh, flourishing. What we do at Research and the Growth, we are like 15 people. We started with a reading group, and then from there we started to organize events and activities, and of course we have contacts with other people, and the conference of course are not um, only the product of our work, but especially of the local organizing committee, which takes up its time the conference. And we decide on the pro next conference with the open call. Uh, we could say, I think, that we were quite successful in bringing the growth strongly into academia. There are now at least more than 100 scientific articles, and there were also seven special issues, most of them results of the international conferences, of which some of them we edited, but somebody else also did it. We could say that now the growth is also taught at the university, and even prestigious one, or so-called prestigious one, such as Science Po in Paris. And the growth is also very much part of the political debate in some countries and at some points. Even Sarkozy had to criticize the growth at some point, so that's quite positive. If they criticize you, it means you're becoming relevant. And it was also mentioned in mainstream media. So that, I think, is also good news. And um, I will leave it here. I've already talked for half an hour. And we're going to discuss a little bit about the vocabulary. You can have a look at the table of context, while which, which with the microphone. Thanks. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, thanks to Federico to give me the floor on time. I will try to be strict also on my presentation, on my part, but it will be hard for me. Um, I'm very tired. I had a long, long trip by train from Italy. And I'm sorry I'm not in, a, in the best uh, mode. Anyway, I will try to do my... 
I will try to do my best. Um, and I, I would like to, to, to start uh, to suggest at least one uh, of the message that you, you can, you should, you should bring on from uh, the Federico talk, from Federico part. Um, and this is synthesized in uh, the other figure that you can see, no? What is important for us is different. The growth is something different, is not more of the same, is not the same of the same as the steady state economics, is not less of the same. We are trying to do something different. We as a degrowthers are thinking, feeling and building a different society. For this reason, during, during the transition, we will not simply struggle for a linear social economic system, no? as we don't simply struggle for a linear elephant. As Federico said, um, my part will be a sort of introduction to our book, so I will try to not to marketize too much our work, that is not just our work, because there are 51 contributions, 51 entries, so 51 uh, participants to this collective uh, and amazing work. Uh, as you can see here, basically there are some concepts that, that are very, very central uh, if you look at it from different perspective. And of course, the biggest is growth. So the critics of growth is very central point of uh, the growth narrative. But of course, they are also uh, positive, let's say, um, uh, items. And uh, you can see, like, the, the most interesting for me is care, but also commons, metabolism, and so on. Uh, of course, I cannot go in deep in the entries. Uh, what I can do is try to, at least, uh, to introduce you uh, to the general themes uh, that we used to synthesize the 51 entries that each contributor uh, prepared for, for the vocabulary. Uh, the themes are um, five, as you can see. So the limits to, of growth, and of course this is, um, uh, is let's say, uh, organized around the critics of growth, the critics of commodification, the critics of GDP, and so on and so far. Also it's important degrowth as autonomy, or degrowth and autonomy, because autonomy is a very central concept, is a one of the main core concepts for the, our vocabulary. Um, degrowth as a repolitization, because we argue that one of the problematics um, point of sustainable development, for example, just to give a, a conceptual uh, context, is the depolitization of the debate that he built. And degrowth and capitalism, because our companions, Marxist, always attacks to us to be not clear enough about uh, our thought uh, concerning capitalism. And then uh, a proposal for a degrowth transition that is based on basically uh, a coherent look at uh, the grassroots practices uh, that are um, not only um, described in the vocabulary, but uh, uh, they are the very practical activity that the growers does in their everyday life. So the limits to growth, um, as I said, is basically um, related to the, the critics of growth, and one of the critics is uh, the growth is an economic. We will see growth is unjust, growth is ecologically unsustainable. Growth is an economic is basically uh, related to the fact that the point that Daly raised in the past in his book, Beyond the Growth, that the benefits 
um, increase um, not faster enough to, to match with the cost that are increasing faster and faster in our society. And, and this is, can also synthesize in terms of the increasing of the cost against wealth. And what is important is also the point of inequality. Um, this is a point that now, I mean, uh, our companion, Thomas Piketty, a very uh, important economist, raised in his book, The Capital, that the, is showing is not one of us, but now is one of our biggest allies in the economic field. Because he's at least repeating and is showing why and how inequality is increasing in our market society and capitalist society. And also he uh, stressed that we, as we does uh, uh, the problematic of the concentration of wealth. The point that I want to uh, just underline now is that uh, even if a growth is an economic, it doesn't mean that it cannot go on. Exactly because the, um, the concentration of wealth is related to also to concentration of power. Mm. And so even if it's an economic, we can go on on doing the same things. Because the benefit, even if they increase not fast enough to match the costs, are, uh, let's say, grasped by very few people. And so they can concentrate wealth. And they can go on with their political socioeconomic system. Then growth is unjust. And here uh, you have a convergence of different kind of uh, lines of thought. The first is basically, we can say, our companion Marxist about the critics of commodification, but also Polanyi criticize a lot the process of marketization of a sphere of society and issues that were out of the market before. Then the problem of unequal access to resources that is underlined together with unequal distribution of cost and benefit by the environmental justice literature. Then we have the, let's say, feminist economics uh, approach that um, since the 70s uh, is trying to, to show up the number of the unpaid cost and unpaid work of uh, the society that are basically uh, the work that um, mainly female are in charge of in our society. That in terms of time is more than the paid work in all the developed society. Then the fact that also the old literature that use different indicators in terms of welfare economics and showing that happiness and welfare is decreasing or, uh, or is basically in stagnation since the 70s, even if the GDP increased. Then ecological and sustainable growth. This is, a, a, let's say, the critiques coming from the, the, the fa showing number and the empirical work, using empirical work that uh, there is still a strong correlation between G GDP and CO2 emission, uh, that the, the, the materialization is not happening, at, at, least, at least in terms of absolute dematerialization. And the fact that uh, there is a, a, a problematic, uh, mm, let's say, block of the technological uh, improvement of the uh, society, that it's not able to uh, solve all the problems that the growth is creating. Sometimes this part of literature related to technology also show that the increasing the efficiency, uh, and this is called in, in the literature German's paradox, uh, basically increase the use of resources and not the other way around. So the, the advancement of technology in a capitalist system normally increase, even if uh, per unit uh, is more efficient, in total uh, increase the use of resources. 
Then there is the other aspect, the other, uh, let's say, sub team of the limits to growth that this growth is coming to an end. And this, is, uh, this has a different kind of uh, approach. Uh, we can divide basically in uh, an economic, uh, in economic approach or biophysical approach. So economic discussion is about the diminishing marginal returns of uh, capital the uh, exhaustion of technological innovation. Uh, and from Marxist uh, Harvey, for example, in his uh, limits to capital, uh, um, underlined the fact that uh, there is a limit in creating effective demands and investment outlets. Um, from a biophysical uh, uh, approach, we can say that uh, there is a limit in natural resource. There is all the discussion about peak oil and peak uh, uh, of resources like phosphorus or very important other resources that are central for uh, our uh, society. And also the problematics that uh, we are living in. Federico and myself as Italian uh, with the, the huge debt indebtedness of our society. But I mean, it's not just a matter of Italy. Uh, as we know, the sum of the public and private uh, indebtedness of the USA is the biggest in the world. So also the problematic of debt creates problems for, for uh, increasing growth, and so the growth could come to an end. Then we, uh, we, I, I will pass to the second team, that is the growth as autonomy. I cannot follow my notes at all, but uh, no. Um, okay, I to, I'm, I'm not an expert on autonomy. Also, I have a problem because I like to be dependent of the people. Um, uh, but basically, we, we, we know that um, uh, there is at least different kind of meanings uh, coming out of the discussion. Uh, uh, about autonomy. Um, basically, I will start with Gortz because I think it's uh, the easiest to grasp. Gortz basically for him means, autonomy means uh, um, to be free from wage labor. So for him, um, gaining autonomy for the society at large means to decommodify a lot of, of basically a lot of activity that we now uh, do for the market. Then there is Ivan Illich that uh, interpret, uh, interpret, interprets uh, autonomy as um, basically autonomy from a complex technological system. For this, one of the most important uh, book of him about autonomy is uh, the book um, that describe, describe the concept of conviviality. And so he, he also developed all, all the discourse about convivial tools. Uh, and this is a very big critique that is uh, part of uh, the sources of uh, the growth now about the complex technological system that also Jacques Ellul criticized in the 70s. And then there is a, uh, the, um, the meaning that uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, Castoriadis, I think, I don't know if some Greek uh, uh, can correct me, uh, give to autonomy. And, and this is basically related to the institution, and so also to the institution of the society. And the Castoriadis means basically, uh, with the Castoriadis means basically uh, with autonomy, uh, the self-determination of the institution in a society. So the ability to determine our own institution, the institution that we are part of. But even if basically we have three different approach and meanings, uh, I, I think there is, these three discourses about autonomy has something, have something uh, in common that are important. The fact that they described about limits as a social choice. 
so not as a catastrophic discourse or impending disaster uh, that forces us to behave in some way or in another. Let's say not as a, we can say example of Al Gore in his inconvenient truth when asked to us to change our behavior because it's impending the CO2 emission and the, uh, the carbon catastrophe. These people are, on the contrary, saying that the limits is a social choice and we are not determined by the external uh, factor. What I can add is that if we are determined by external factor, we are uh, entangled in a depolitization discourse. Because, of course, there is something outside of us that forced us to change, but not a political vision that uh, forced us to change or encourage us to change. And this is the importance of also on the, not on the self-limitation of the individual, but the fact that all these three discuss of the collective self-limitation. And Castoriadis clarified this, but uh, I think uh, for, for, um, for the other two authors, uh, Ehrlich uh, and Gortz was clear too. So De Groot, and I introduced a little bit before, De Groot is a repolitization. Uh, exactly, now at the beginning, a, a lot of people underlined the fact that uh, um, De Groot was a missile world, uh, a stone, uh, dangerous uh, tools that we have in, in hand uh, to repolitize, repoliticize environmentalism and also fake, then the fake consensus about sustainable development, but also about uh, the narrative of climate change nowadays. Um, the, this repolitization is basically very central uh, for us, and uh, it concerns not only, let's say, the po social political debate, but also the science. Uh, and, for, um, and for this, one of our, let's say, companion, um, that work with us is the post-normal science approach that is trying in some way to uh, politicize the science against the te uh, technocratization of politics. No? Uh, also in some way to debunk the expert, to debunk uh, the, the scientist. Um, and then the other aspect is uh, a player for the pants that uh, is the epilog, let's say, of our dictionary, uh, the, a collective uh, determination of the use of surplus that each society um, produces uh, in different kind of context. Then uh, we came to the fourth team. Okay. Uh, degrowth and capitalism. And, and as, I, as I said, it was uh, some way forced to us to discuss about capitalism by our companion Marxists that uh, want uh, a clear position about capitalism. And even if for me it was uh, uh, enough clear, we clarify it in the, in the book this time. And our, our idea is basically, our thesis is basically that uh, growth is an imperative for capitalism for two reasons. Uh, we accept the first, uh, let's say, um, a reason that the Marxists basically developed is the technical economic reason. So the fact that the capital um, for increase uh, its cap capital as a social system for is forced to increase uh, uh, the accumulation of capital, so it's forced to expand the economic system. But w what is important for us, us and uh, I will underline a little bit more, this aspect is the social political reason. I mean, growth is an imperative because basically, uh, thanks to the growth, uh, the lib you have nowadays, we have nowadays the neoliberal consensus. The fact that the growth was realized 
all around developed society and now is coming also in so-called undeveloped countries they gain, let's say, the ideological debate about, and, and they also avoid, uh, basically, the redistributive conflict of the production, claiming that the fact that we are increasing, then there will be a trickle-down effort that will allow to all the people to gain and increase their access to resources and well-being. And exactly because uh, this ideological aspect is very important to maintain the society as it is now, uh, the growth is an imperative for all the political elite and socioeconomic elites all around the world. Because if the growth is not realized, probably, and very probably, and we are ready for that, uh, the distributive conflict will rise again as in 19th and 20th centuries. So basically, uh, we can synthesize, and we will see now in the last part of my presentation, uh, the growth is about imagining and constructing or, or something that is already in the process of being uh, built a non-capitalist society. And all the now utopias are the very practices on which we are looking for and we are participating in to develop a non capitalist society. And now I come to the last part of my presentation. Not exactly the last, but I'm, I'm almost there. So uh, the fifth team that we developed, uh, we developed in the introduction of the book was a, a sort of proposal for a degrowth transition. And this is based basically on, uh, um, on four aspects. So the grassroots economic practices, so the utopia, the welfare institution without growth, the money great credit institution that are, that are blooming, the politics of degrowth transition. So the characteristics, I mean, I can list utopias like uh, eco-communities, urban gardening, uh, uh, housing, um, transition town in some part of them. But what is interesting perhaps now is also to, to, to look at the characteristic of, uh, of uh, these utopias. And this, basically, the difference, as we know, um, in the market system, we have the uh, production for exchange value and production for use value. What you can see is that in Autopia, the production for use value is the prevalent. Uh, of course, you don't delete the production for exchange value, but uh, what fosters you in, uh, in your activity is basically the production of use value for the community and society and neighborhood. Then is for this reason, it's not built in, an, uh, in the dynamic of accumulate and expand. So it's basically it's not a capitalist approach to the production and consumption system. Uh, normally, uh, there is a reduction of wage labor because a different kind of activity and uh, possibility to participate and to be part of the nautopias um, are different and are not always related to a wage, then the circulation is not a, a, an exchange, but uh, is related to the, what we know as a gift economy, so in, basically on reciprocity, and so also on uh, um, a very anti-utilitarian, let's say, uh, logic, and not utilitarian one. And then there is, of course, the commoning aspect of it. So. Um, the fact that nautopias are related to not just to, pro to the production, but also to reset the institution that allows production, consumption, redistribution. And so the common thing is a complex process of being in a uh, community. Then we have also the welfare institution without growth. Uh, and basically, we have different kind of um, instruments 
Uh, here I, I, I will speak about uh, three, basically job guarantee, that is um, basically is the idea that the state will be uh, uh, the, su the supply of last resort of work. So for the, all the unemployed, uh, the state will create and um, will give them a job. And this can be related all, all to what we can call uh, the care, not of private context, but also social context. So all the unpaid, normally unpaid work that now is the very big burden of women, basically, in society. Then the other uh, tools is the, um, the use, the couple use of basic income and uh, maximum income or ceiling, maximum income, so yeah. a, a, a taxation on the top of um, salary per year. And basically it's not a very revolutionary, um, let's say, Proposal. You can think that in the 1950s uh, is an hour, so not a leftist. In USA, uh, had a taxation up to $200,000 uh, per year, up to 98%. So every dollar that was earned in the 50s under Eisenhower in USA was taxed at 1980%. Um, and this is, of course, associated to a basic income. So uh, it's, I can avoid to say something about this because it's a very clear concept that also is part of uh, political debate. And then there is also the work sharing. So the fact that we uh, can share um, not only space of work, but also the our work with unemployed. And this is also a way to, to give a, a sort of a, um, solution to the unemployment uh, problem. Then there is money, money and credit institution um, practices, and this is basically community currencies. That is a way, this, this also is, a, is increasing a lot. Uh, during, before, during, and after the crisis. Um, a lot of community currencies we have in Europe, but also in Latin America. And it's basically uh, a way to, the, to um, let's say, re-territorialize re the uh, production and the resources that uh, is in circulation in a certain territory. Then uh, the discussion about public money, the fact that the state basically has to regain the power on, uh, on the supply of, uh, of the money, and so take it back from the private banks. And then also the, um, the debt audits, that was a practice is uh, coming out uh, above all in Spain after the, or during the Indignados movement, that was basically uh, a collective way uh, from bottom up to understand what really means uh, the debt in Spain, uh, who are the creditors, who are the debitors, to have a selective take on it. So to, to, to decide a jubilee for some of this debt and to repay back some of the other. And for example, I will say that we are, we should be with the young Minister of Economy of Argentina that is trying to avoid the way back to the hedge fund of Americans. That is exactly the kind of, ju uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, jubilee that we sh should uh, support. So we support uh, the Minister of Economy in Argentina they have not to pay the hedge funds of USA. Well, basically then we have the, the politics of transition and we, we developed uh, with Federico, Claudio Cattaneo and myself this idea of uncivil and civil practices 
um, and we focus basically on the uncivil practices of uh, the grotters. Uh, with uncivil, we basically mean uh, practices, individual and networks that are not uh, governmentalized by the idea of uh, doing things for create what is called the social capital. And so to make uh, a new valorization of what they do uh, in their everyday practices. And with Uncivil, of course, we have a financial disobedience. Uh, one of our friends in, in Barcelona, for example, uh, Duran, Eric Duran, that um, with this financial disobedience uh, refused to give back 500,000 euros to banks and invested in, in the social movement of Spain in Catalonia. Then in terms of what we can do in, uh, with, the, with the, let's say, institutional uh, parties, I, I will suggest and we suggest to, to leak to leak in parliamentary politics. So try to, uh, to, to, to convince um, at different level from the municipality uh, to, to the European Parliament to politicians of different parties to uh, focus and to implement some of the policies that we have to show, that, we have, uh, that I, have to sh I have showed before, like uh, basic and ceiling income or uh, trying to fight back uh, and um, the, um, the supply of public money. And then the last part is, of course, is taking part of the social movement. This is a constituent part of uh, the growth's pra practices, and we have to go on, on doing this. Then this is the really final part, and this is related basically to, uh, to what it was a suggestion to, let's say, younger uh, than me, uh, researcher uh, that together with us can develop new, new line of research on, let's say, foundational claims of the growth, but uh, that are still not uh, um, convincing enough uh, in the academia um, context. And this is, a, this is about uh, the impossibility of the materialization. No? That the debate is still there, and still we have to, to show that uh, what we claim that, that, that the materialization is not possible. Um, we still have to convince our uh, colleagues. Um, the same is um, the fact that basically we are not saying this. Because, I mean, very important economists are saying that uh, developed economies are entering in a period of systemic stagnation. Um, but we have still convinced the others that uh, are not convinced about this, that the stagnation is there and will not go uh, out. And then for this could, could be like a, the fact idea, we always say that uh, if we abandon the growth, imaginary, the growth society, there will be a revival of politics and, uh, and nourishment of democracy, but we have to, in some way, demonstrate it. We claim that it's true, will be true, but we are, we are not sure it will be, uh, of course, can be a different kind of results, like a more authoritarian uh, community, uh, and we have a lot of this emergency all around um, South Europe nowadays, like in Greece is an example of uh, fascist uh, parties that are uh, taking the power. So when well, the future of the growth is in your and our hands, and we will do our best to, to show how different and why we are different from them. Thank you very much. Thanks. Those who were sleeping can wake up now.
belly to your neighbor, it's over. So thanks, thanks a lot, of course. And it's, and it's gonna be, it's gonna finish soon, don't worry. Of course, this was just an attempt to articulate some of the main aspects that have been part of the debate. We are not expert in all of these issues, of course. And um, this is not complete. Nothing is done, and we sincerely hope you completely disagree with us. And this, of course, is the work of the next day to discuss all this. And I'm sure that lots of people here have lots of ideas and better arguments than we have. But we made an attempt to summarize a little bit the debate for the people who really didn't know anything or were coming here um, to a bigger conference for the first time. Um, I invite you also, and this is a, like, uh, you know, advertisement spot for the book. Tomorrow we are presenting it in this room, HS4, at 9 o'clock you are welcome to come. It will be a little bit uh, different to what we are explaining today, hopefully. And that we are advertising a book that is not published, so that's a little bit of a joke. But uh, it, I mean, it will exist soon. Hopefully it will come out in November. So now um, it would be nice, you know, to open up the floor to you and let you ask questions and all. Um, but I think it makes no sense. We have too many people here to discuss. So we are going to propose to split in smaller groups. So I'm going to explain how it works and hopefully it's going to be clear. So I'm going to show you a slide in which you can see the names of the facilitator, the room in which there will be, and a specific topic that eventually, if some of the participants are interested, you can discuss with them. So there are two options in the small groups. You can discuss about general things, the disagreements with the presentation and all, or you can discuss on a more specific topic. Of course, the facilitator is going to facilitate the discussion. So do not expect the facilitators to know about everything or give you answers. We should look for the answers together. So most of the facilitators only speak English. Few of them speak German too. So how are we going to divide the rooms? The rooms, we don't know where they are, but the facilitators know. So it's, the rooms are S200 something, and it's in the next building, hopefully on the other side of the courtyard. So I'm going to show you the list, and I'm going to invite one by one the facilitators. They're going to come here. And you can decide. If you like the person, then you can go after him or her. Is that OK? Should we try? So then we should be a little bit, so I've asked the facilitator to be flexible, and I'm asking you to be flexible too. So if there are 60 people in a group, then we can split up. I mean, let's self-organize a little bit. So I invite Barbara Muraka to come on the stage. And she's ready to talk about sources of degrowth in general. So what I mentioned before, democracy, ecological economics, ecology, etc. She speaks German and English. So those who wants to go with her can follow her. The groups ideally should be of around 40 people. And you can see, so she will be in room S212, OK? So if you miss Barbara, then you can look for her in the room. So I, so I invite Barbara to leave and go in the room, and those who are interested can follow her. And I invite uh, Simone D'Alessandro to come and Christian to prepare. So Simone D'Alessandro is a researcher from Pisa University, and he's specialized, we could say, is on ecological macroeconomics, uh, macroeconomics models too. So you can discuss with him about this or something less specific. So those who want to follow Simone, Christian, come on the stage so the people can. Christian, is, uh, Christian Kessner is an um, ecological economist with a thesis, PhD thesis on peak oil. So with him, you can discuss uh, especially about ecological limits, but about also steady state and degrowth in general. He will be in room 214. So those who want to follow Christian. Daniela. Claudio. Silvia. So Daniela is an expert in... Can you come up? Daniela is an expert on uh, environmental justice, also working on a project called EJOLD, Mapping Environmental Conflicts Around the World. So those who are interested in these uh, topics of environmental conflicts, environmental justice, can follow her. She's in room 215, and she speaks German too. Claudio, 
Silvia, Cristos, Irina, no, pues, Irina, Irina Velico, can you come up on the stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she can help you discussing about social movements and also if you're interested in post communism. She's also an expert in environmental justice. Irina Velico. Silvia Loret has been involved in degrowth for a while. She is an expert in sustainable consumption, dematerialization, ecological economics, and she speaks German too. And she will be in the room 222. Silvia Loret. Thanks. Claudio. Claudio Cataneo has a thesis on um, rural and urban squatting in Barcelona and can discuss with you about voluntary simplicity but also about critique with technology if you are interested. So Claudio will be in room 220. Just one, otherwise they will get confused. Okay. So Christos, Geographers and uh, Angelos, which will be in room 223. And with, with them you can discuss about uh, deliberative democracy, politics, autonomy. Angelos is an expert on Castoriadis too, and a little bit about the commons also. They will be in room two, two, three. Thanks. Gustavo. Gustavo Garcia Lopez. He's an expert on the commons. His work also with the Ostrom. And uh, you can discuss with him about the growth and commons, and he will be he will be in room two two five. And uh, if you have any further questions at all, me and Giacomo will also be in two separate rooms, hopefully. Thank you very much, and enjoy the conference. And of course, thank you again to the local organizing committee and the technical people, including the interpreter. Thanks.